Hello, in this video, I want to talk about ethical duties. So in previous lectures on philosophy, I introduced ethics in terms of several different approaches, primary approaches. I've also, in another video, 6.2, suggested that probably from a Christian perspective, virtue ethics is the more basic ethical approach um, that would orient a, a Christian way of thinking. Now, to be sure, there are many uh, Christian approaches to ethics that are more uh, what we call uh, duty-based or deontological approaches. And in fact, I want to talk about um, the role of duties, ethical duties, ethical principles, ethical um, uh, absolutes at times. Uh, it's been formulated how these sorts of approaches to ethics might might fit within a particular Christian uh, perspective. I would say that there are there have been many cultural expressions of Christian ethics that have taken a primarily duty-based approach. Uh, I don't believe these are the most biblical approaches. Again, what I'm saying I hope will become clear as we continue to, um, to look at ethical duties from a Christian perspective. Okay, so we're talking about duty-based ethics here. And I think probably in popular American Christianity, duty-based ethics takes on what we might call an absolutist form. Now, I would say that, that absolutism is not very precisely understood. Not only with, and when I say popular, I mean some very thoughtful approaches to ethics, Francis Schaeffer and so forth. Francis Schaeffer, I, I admire him uh, in many respects. I admire him for the intellectual climate um, that he, and the, the question, uh, the, the, the approach that tries to answer questions that he had at Labrie. And, and so I'm not, I'm not, uh, I want to be respectful of Francis Schaeffer. However, I do believe that American Christianity, uh, evangelical Christianity, maybe, maybe I should say fundamentalist Christianity, has had a rather simplistic sense of, of what duty-based ethics would look like. So an absolute, by, by precise definition, an absolute is something for which there is no exception. So if you say, um, this is the right thing to do, except in this circumstance, then you're not being absolutist on that particular issue. This is why I introduced this idea of universal ethics. And of course, it's not, I've not come up with this. But we can speak of duty-based ethics in a universal form that is not absolutist. That is, for which there are exceptions uh, to the rule. And I do believe that this is the primary biblical mode in which duties are, ex are expressed. I do think that, that um, duties are expressed within a virtue-oriented context in the, in the New Testament. And there are duties. But when you approach it from a more uh, principled or um, a virtue approach, then the duties uh, have a hierarchy to them. In fact, it is impossible for all duties to be absolute um, because they come into conflict with each other. There, there are situations where you have two duties uh, that um, come into play and, and you have to choose one over the other. And that means that you have to take an exception to the one duty because the other duty takes priority. In that sense, those duties are not absolute because you're making exceptions to them. And so uh, there is a lot of, I think, confusion, a lot of circular reasoning. Circular reasoning is when you assume your conclusion in your argument. Well, that's not, a, that's not valid. And so, for example, some people treat absolute ethics as if, 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 a eth if you treat ethics as not being absolute in a particular circumstance, that therefore you don't believe in right and wrong. But that's wrong. That's, that's confused. Um, uh, there are other confusions out there. So it is, I was reading from uh, uh, Francis Collins, The Language of God, and even he confuses the difference between absolutes when it comes to the realm of truth. Uh, 
epistemology and absolutes when it comes to the realm of ethics. These are two different situations. Um, and so the, I, I find people just flow from, uh, if you don't believe in any absolutes, then you can't make that statement uh, because that's an absolute statement. Well, that's an epistemological claim. Ethics is a, is it an epistemological claim or is it a different kind of claim? And so there's all basically, and I'm sorry, this is a long preface. There is lots of confusion uh, out there on the question of absolutes and um, it is rampant and it is, it, it, and people get very riled up over, ah, you know, but, and they don't really understand what they're saying. So let's launch in with that long, way too long prologue. So duty-based ethics not only has the kind of exceptionless form of ethics. By the way, I, I believe the Pharisees were, had become a duty-based ethics. At least the, the way the New Testament speaks about the Pharisees, they had become a duty-based uh, ethic um, in a problematic form. In fact, I, I'm going to argue in this video that both Jesus and Paul argued against uh, the kind of absolutist duty-based ethic of the Pharisees and, and the Judaizers and, and so forth. Okay, there, but there is a universal form that says these are universally timeless, timelessly valid principles to which exceptions must be made when there's a conflict in the hierarchy of values. So let me go to Immanuel Kant. Uh, I am quite, um, quite the Kantian when it comes to epistemology. See other videos in this series. However, I think in terms of ethics, Kant was an idiot. <laughs> Let me be frank. The, the categorical imperative is a, a complete failure. He tried to express it several different ways. Uh, eventually, he said, oh, it's, it's really the golden rule. You know, no, it's not the golden rule. Um, so he would say, act only on that maxim through which you can at the same time will that it should be a universal law. What, what he's basically saying is, if something is right, then it is always the, course, the right course of action in every circumstance with no exceptions. Well, that's a bit of a, there's, a hidden, there's an assumption here. It's an unproved assumption that because, um, for example, um, it might be right for me to intervene in a, in, a, um, in a certain circumstance in a particular occasion, but not appropriate for me to intervene in another occasion. And it's the context of, of what's going on. I don't know, I'm trying to think of something. Let's say, let's say that um, somebody is trying to learn how to, um, you know, to walk as a, a baby. Um, well, that's a bad example. But I mean, there, there are times where it's best to let somebody experience failure or, or, or let somebody experience um, a circumstance, not to, not to rush in like a math problem, uh, or, or let's talk about pain. Um, in general, I wish to help people avoid pain, but getting the pain of an inoculation can be a good thing because it, it leads to a greater good. What I'm saying is, so, so while in some circumstances, it might be good for me to help someone avoid pain. In other circumstances, it would not be right for me to help someone avoid pain. Well, the way Kant formulates his categorical uh, imperative, if something is right in one circumstance, then it must be right in all circumstance, and that's basically ludicrous. Eh, sorry, Kant, you're just an idiot when it comes to this. The categorical imperative basically is, is dead on arrival. It has honorable mention. You can go home now, Kant. I like your epistemology. But this, this simply fails repeatedly. I think uh, uh, Robert Wolf, in his book discussing it, he says, um, it's good to flush the toilet. Well, therefore, is it always good to flush the toilet? Should everybody flush the toilet at the same instance? Um, uh, <laughs> he says, if everybody should, would flush the toilet at the same instance, though, then the entire uh, water system of the world would fail, and therefore, it must be universally wrong for everybody to flush the toilet at the same. I mean, basically, Kant tried to make uh, make it into if it's right in one circumstance, it's always right, or if it's wrong in one circumstance, it's always wrong. And the fact of the matter is that the meaning of actions is contextual. That that's the bottom line here. And and so to focus on the act apart from the context 
is a non-starter. Okay, I'm sorry, that may not have been clear. Let me keep going. There is a scope to right and wrong action. There, moral absolute, so let me go through the various options. The first option is the Kantian option, moral absolutism. Uh, this is the claim that there are some moral norms and principles that are both universal and exceptionless. Now, I do believe in moral absolutes. Uh, for example, um, Jesus tells us to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. There is no circumstance where that it would be appropriate to make an exception to that rule. Those are the mother of all moral absolutes. They are biblically through and through. Um, those, so those apply in every context, in every situation. There is never a situation where it would be appropriate to make an exception to the love of God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And there would never be an exception to the rule of loving your neighbors yourself. And these two rules do not conflict with each other. That is to say, there is never a circumstance where love of God would require you to make an exception to love of neighbor. They go hand in hand. They, they are of a piece. Now, are there other moral norms uh, to which there are no exceptions? Well, this is a good question. Uh, but, you know, in a philosophy context, you can almost always come up with some ridiculous um, a circumstance in which it would be appropriate to make an exception. Um, you know, if you think of murder, would it ever be appropriate to murder an innocent person? Well, I suppose, what do you mean by murder? Um, uh, I know there are exceptions to thou shalt not kill, at least in the Bible there are. So um, certainly the, um, the Ten Commandments, when it says thou shalt not kill, it's clear from the from the law itself, that doesn't mean capital punishment. There's capital punishment all over uh, the Old Testament law, and therefore, thou shalt not kill can't mean no capital punishment. Um, uh, there may be uh, war, for example. Uh, there's war commanded in uh, the Old Testament, uh, and war is the assumption uh, of the, the law, I would say, because law war is, is universal. And so it seems to me very, very difficult to argue that when the Ten Commandments says thou shalt not kill, it did not have war um, in view. Uh, and so what we see, um, it, it, it probably did not have self-defense uh, in view. Uh, in other words, if someone, if it's you or someone else who's trying to kill you or your family or whatever, it's doubtful to me that the, the commandment meant thou shalt not kill in that instance. So, so uh, thou shalt not kill is not an absolute um, in, in the Ten Commandments. It is probably more of a universal, that is, a principle that has a universal objective validity, but may not always be exceptionist. Now, murder, thou shalt not murder, um, is a much better candidate uh, for an absolute principle. We do, I mean, we can get into thought experiments even here, though. So, for example, what if... Uh, what about Hiroshima or Nagasaki or, or Dresden? Uh, there, were, there were countless uh, Germans in Dresden or Japanese in Hiroshima, you know, who were killed, who basically were minding their own business, children, babies, you know, uh, newborns. There were newborns in Nagasaki who died in the nuclear explosion. Was that murder? Um, uh, it, 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 okay, it gets difficult. I mean, I'm willing to say that murder is an absolute wrong. I'm willing to say that. Um, uh, I think we might be able to argue that. But you see what I'm saying? It, it gets a little bit more complicated uh, the further that we, we get into it. And of course, um, uh, Kant uh, is going to be doing all kinds of mental gymnastics in the corner uh, on, on thou shalt not kill in the manner that I've, uh, I've just talked about, uh, if he's consistent. Well, the point is, is that there actually are probably very few um, absolutes. Uh, thou shalt not commit adultery uh, seems to me to be a, a ethical rule to which there is no um, uh, exception and, and so forth. But do you see, you see what I'm getting at here? That, that really, while we talk a lot in, com, in pop, pop Christianity, we talk a lot about absolutes, but really most ethics fit within the category of universal rights and wrongs, with exceptions. This, this is actually where I would say the Bible is 
by and large. That, that the reason why we focus on absolute so much is a, is a cultural thing that we don't even know we're part of the winds of culture. Um, and so if we understand the Bible in context, I would argue it, it falls much more under the number two category than it falls under the number one category. Ethical relativism. Of course, um, again, in, in common pop discussion, the two choices that you're often given are absolutism or relativism. But as it turns out, um, these are not the only two options. And in fact, ethical relativism is usually defined as moral nihilism. And it's not moral nihilism. Moral nihilism is my number five. Ethical relativism is the idea that there are no universally valid moral principles, that all moral principles are valid relative to culture for individual choice. Well, of course, at its most fundamental, Christianity is not this. Christianity believes in fundamental universal rights and wrongs, like uh, the value of life, uh, for example. Um, and so this is not what Christianity is not fundamentally relativistic. That's true. However, there are many issues that are relativistic, even from a Christian perspective, even from a biblical perspective. And we're going to talk about those in a moment. Let me just give you a teaser. Convictions. If somebody has a conviction about something, that means that they believe God doesn't want them or to do something or wants them to do something. Now, that God doesn't require or forbid other people. Well, by definition, that's, that's an example of a relativism. It's not a fundamental relativism because, you know, love your neighbors yourself is an absolute. But it is a, uh, a individual item of relativism. And so anybody who's ever had a conviction. So I have a, I have a, a relative who believes that God does not want her to cut her hair at all. Um, so that is a conviction that the Lord has given her. Is it a conviction that the Lord has given other women? No, it isn't. And so that's an example of a relativism, a conviction that this person has that other Christians don't have. So you can see it's more complex than the Francis Schaeffers of the world uh, would like to, to portray it. There are gradations if we want to be more precise in our, our language of these things. Um, cultural relativism, therefore, asks, are there things that would be right or wrong on a cultural level in one culture that aren't wrong in another? Well, I think we can find examples of this, perhaps. So I suspect there may be, there may be places where uh, Arab Christians, uh, Arabs, let's say Arab women who are Christians, um, may feel like they should cover their head uh, or cover their legs. When they're, there may be certain clothing standards that an Arab uh, Christian woman uh, would believe the Lord requires of women in that culture that the Lord doesn't seem to require of women in, say, American Christianity. That would be an example of a kind of cultural uh, relativism. Um, and, then, and I've already mentioned individual relativism. Uh, this is where I believe this is right or wrong for me, but it may be different for you. Again, this is not the, the whole of Christian ethics because there are rights and wrongs, right? Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not murder. There are universal rights and wrongs for Christians, but not all rights and wrongs are universal or absolute for Christians. And we can see, we can see that they're this from the, the Bible. The, the Nazarite, as I'll say again, Nazarites were... A, a small group of Israelites who could not cut their hair, who could not drink alcohol, you know, and so forth. Not all Israelites. It was a group, uh, an individual Israelite who became a Nazarite. And that is an example of a kind of rel relativism within the Old Testament e ethics. Okay, uh, by the way, let me give you an example of a biblical uh, universal right and wrong that is not absolute. Um, Romans 13 says to obey those who are in authority over you, right? Um, and yet, in Acts 4, Peter says, I'm not going to obey you, Jewish leaders, because I need to obey God rather than you. So you can see that in the book of Acts, Peter makes an exception 
to the universal principle of obeying those in authority over you. So it, there is a universal principle in Romans 13 to obey the government. However, to pay your taxes, for example. However, there are exceptions to be made. And so the, the, the principle of obeying those in authority over you is not an absolute principle. It is a universal principle. See, see how this works? So again, I, I sometimes beat my head up against the wall with the kind of the simplicity, uh, the, not simplicity, but the, the kind of simplistic nature of, of arguments that are made uh, in this realm. They just, they don't hold up, unfortunately. Um, even, even the barest of scrutiny, um, some of the rhetoric that happens in Christian, pop Christian circles, it just, it just evaporates with the smallest of examination. So we can do better. Um, there is also moral skepticism, which is basically, maybe there's good, maybe there isn't, I don't know. Um, uh, this is not a fundamentally, uh, most Christian ethics is not going to be, um, you know, of this sort. Although, there may be issues where, in seasons of time, we aren't quite sure what the Lord uh, would require of the church. New issues arise, and the church has to wrestle through with it. Uh, that's not to say that they won't eventually come uh, to some kind of a conclusion. Sometimes groups go their separate way. This group forms this conclusion, that group forms another. Let's say uh, that the, uh, the EEG of a, uh, let's say a person um, is uh, un, you know, they're not able to breathe for 15 minutes, and but they are revived. Their body their body works, uh, but they're they're unconscious and their brain scan is flat. And so that is that that current technology says uh, there is no brain activity whatsoever. Well, is that is that person still alive or is that person really dead? These are these are things where I personally think that uh, that we will we will form conclusions on that sort of, uh, of question, but um, it is difficult to know, you know, who is right and who is wrong on, on that, particular, that particular question. At least it, it, it's a matter of conversation, certainly, uh, in the church. Moral nihilism is, of course, the, the Nietzsche, uh, the, the Machiavelli, that basically the, the moral nihilists would say there's no valid moral principles at all. Nietzsche would say we make them up. Or, or that is supermen make up the, what morality is and then convince others. Again, this is not a fundamentally uh, Christian perspective, although there are issues where we don't believe there is an ethical right or wrong. You know, which, which kind of dessert uh, should I get? Which kind of ice cream? Okay, I'm going up for ice cream after lunch. Am I gonna have the strawberry or am I gonna have the chocolate? There is probably no fundamental um, moral perspective on that particular thing. Um, and so there are issues where there is no moral claim. So do you see, do you see how what I'm arguing here is that, that um, it's not as simple as either you're an absolutist or you're a relativist. Well, Christians are absolutists on ethics in the sense that we believe love God and love neighbor are absolute principles. But when it comes to the playing out of individual ethical decisions, there, there is a kind of a gradation of things. Um, the core moral principles, I've argued, um, or, the, or the, the core moral um, values of Christianity tend to be universal and timeless, but with exceptions. And we create a hierarchy of things. Um, and then we, we decide, okay, is this higher than this in the hierarchy in this particular context? There are some, there's room for convictions. There is room for what we call contextualization which is a kind of, of relativism of culture, applying Christianity to specific cultures. Do they believe in right or wrong? Yes. Relativism does believe in right or wrong. It just believes that it's right or wrong for an individual or right or wrong for a particular culture. Um, and so the whole, the whole idea of contextualization is determining what God's will is for a particular context. And of course, we've had opposition to that sort of things. There, there have been those who have opposed the idea of contextualization um, in missions and so forth. I believe that is a fundamentally problematic opposition. That is to oppose contextualization in missions is to, is to potentially do harm uh, in the name of Christ. Uh, those who don't believe in contextualization uh, have no business being involved in Christian missions at all uh, because they don't understand how the world works. Um, but these things have been fought 
in the past. Um, and having a, a more profound understanding of the categories is very important, I think, um, lest we become an offense to the gospel, a stumbling block uh, to others coming to Christ. Well, I've got some examples here that are somewhat fun. Uh, so, for example, uh, Plato was an absolutist. Uh, Plato believed that um, if something was right, then it was always right, no matter what the circumstance. Um, he has a famous story uh, in the Republic, uh, sometimes called the myth of Gyges' ring, in which a man uh, is able to become invisible. And so Plato um, poses the question, now that he can get away with anything, should he do whatever he wants? And of course, I agree with Plato on his conclusion. Plato's conclusion is, no, he should still do what is right, even though um, he can get away with it. So I agree with Plato on his conclusion in that particular story. The Stoics were absolutists. Let justice be done, though the heavens fall. In other words, it's better for the whole universe to blow up uh, than for us to violate a moral principle. Um, well, um, uh, that, again, this, this would be the spirit of somebody who's a pacifist, for example, uh, who says uh, it is always wrong to murder. So even though you're going to rape my family or, you know, and so forth, I, I must do what is right and um, not, um, you know, not fight you, not harm you. Um, that would be a, a kind of stoic absolutism uh, in a pacifist context. Kant's categorical imperative, I've already, I've already mentioned. Okay, so those are some examples of absolutists uh, in uh, philosophy. Kant, of course, living around 1800. Um, here are some examples of right of those who've looked at the idea of, of right and wrong being universal, but with there being exceptions, where we prioritize our values. Uh, I would say that Jesus and Paul fall into this category. Now, on some things, I say on some things because both Jesus and Paul viewed the love of God and the love of neighbor as absolutes to which there is no exception. But clearly, Jesus made exceptions to rules. He gets in trouble for it. Jesus gets in trouble for letting his disciples pluck grain on the Sabbath. And his opponents say, hey, it's the Sabbath. This is wrong. And Jesus is basically like, um, I'm more important than the Sabbath. Uh, the Sabbath was made for humanity, not humanity uh, for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was not made as a rule to break humanity with. Um, it is meant for the benefit of, of humanity. Jesus clearly uh, made exceptions to many things, and it got him into trouble. One of the, in fact, one of the main reasons that people got upset with Jesus was because he did not treat the rules as absolutes, but he treated them as having exceptions. Same thing with Paul. You know, to the Jews, I became like the Jews. Um, to, the, to those who aren't Jews, I became like those who aren't Jews, which is clearly contextualization. Paul is contextualizing the gospel. He is playing it out one way, you know, and so uh, when he's at Antioch, uh, you know, and, and the, the, the stricter, more, the more absolutist Jews say, well, we've got we've to nail down where this food has come from. We've got to nail down how this food has been prepared, and we've got to nail down where these Gentiles have been, because we can't eat together unless we figure that out. And Paul's basically like, the unity of the church takes precedence over this clean and unclean stuff, and so we need to eat together. Uh, and make an exception to whatever purity rules uh, you might believe in for, in for the sake of the unity of the body of Christ. Cultural relativism. Well, there are lots of examples of how different cultures have had different um, views. Now, I've, I put Inuit here, uh, but what I, I mean are basically indigenous uh, peoples of Alaska. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure uh, whether Inuit applies. There's There's been a lot of conversation recently about what to call various uh, indigenous peoples um, in um, Canada and Alaska. Uh, so Inuit may not be the right uh, term. Uh, we, used, we used to refer to them as Eskimos, but that's not, uh, that's not the, uh, the way they refer to themselves. Uh, but uh, for a time, uh, in, in previous uh, times of scarcity, it was considered appropriate uh, to let the elderly die uh, within that community, indigenous community, by starvation. There's a famous story about a, a grandfather that says to his son, uh, son, let's go hunting. And the son uh, realizes that his father is basically saying, I'm a burden to, to the family. There aren't enough resources. It's time for me to, to go out and, uh, and not come back. And so the father and the son go out hunting, and the son only returns, uh, returns back. Uh, this was considered 
the virtuous thing uh, to do in uh, uh, an indigenous culture uh, for a long time. Thankfully, we now uh, live in a world where that doesn't have to happen. Uh, maybe it never did. I mean, that's the debate, right? But certainly that culture considered it appro appropriate. There's a fun story in Herodotus's um, histories where the Greeks uh, and the, the, basically the Persian king gets the Greeks and another people called the Galatians and asks them how they bury their, what they do with their, their parents when they die. And the Greeks talk about how they burn them on a funeral pyre. And the Galatians just think that that's abhorrent. How could you do that? What you immoral people. So the Persians ask the Galatians, well, what do you do with your, your dead? Why we eat them, of course. That way we have them with us forever, you know. And, and they are completely, that's the right thing to do. Of course you eat your, your dead relatives. Uh, it'd, be, it'd be wrong, you know. Anyway, I'm not saying that some of these aren't wrong. Um, but I am saying that if we'd have been born a Galatian, we would have thought that that was the moral thing to do. This is the problem, of course, is that, and, and Herodotus ends that story by saying that custom is king overall, meaning that what we think right or wrong is largely depends on where we were born. This is, of course, one of the, the philosophical questions about Christianity. Christianity makes universal claims. Um, and yet I know that if I'd have been born uh, in a different part of the world in a different place, would I be a Christian? I hope I hope I would be, but this is these are the questions uh, that that um, uh, are challenges sometimes how to figure to figure out. Um, the Greeks cremated their dead, as I said, on a funeral pyre, uh, as we've seen in many a movie uh, lately. Uh, in Egypt, ancient Egypt, the household was buried with the husband, including his wife, alive. Um, you know, so it's, sometimes it's good not to be born in a certain uh, economic status, because this probably didn't, I don't know if this happened on the, uh, the, the poor level, but certainly if you were rich, uh, then your wife uh, would be buried with you if you were uh, a man in ancient Egypt. Um, I mean, he's going to be lonely in the afterlife, right? Family needs to go with him. Um, practice not done today. Uh, the, the practice of suti is thing, is, has been outlawed now for a long time in India. But the, the widow of someone who died, similar to Egypt, was burned to death on the funeral pyre. What a horrible way to go, the wife being you know, forced uh, to die with the husband. Um, horrible from my perspective. And, and of course, these examples of cultural relativism, um, I, I, don't, I, I don't ultimately believe that right or wrong is or should be completely relativistic. Uh, I think contextualization is necessary. Uh, but my Christian values kick in, you know, on some of these things, uh, certainly. Um, of course, the, 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 that's a whole question. When do they kick in? Uh, but, you know, I believe that the base camp of Christian ethics is universal rights and wrongs. And I, I would not, uh, for example, I, I support the illegality of burning a widow on her funeral pyre or burying a wife with alive with her, her husband. Uh, I, I, those things... I think we can argue are universally inappropriate, indeed wrong. Um, but it is an example of the relativism that has exist. A famous book was written on the mountain people, uh, the Ik people, who seem to have no sense of duty toward their children or their parents or anything. Um, some would argue that, it's, that this is, was just a sick culture, um, that, that some cultures are sick. Um, Polygamy is acceptable in Muslim societies. Indeed, there are, there are Christian places where polygamy has been uh, practiced, and this is an issue that um, uh, missionaries have sometimes had to deal with. What do we do? Uh, this person has become a Christian. They have four wives and children with all the wives. Uh, so what do we do? Uh, do? Does he pick one and divorce them? Uh, does he just have sex with the first one he married? Um, all of these seem uh, difficult. Uh, kinds of perspectives uh, because they do damage to the other wives and children and so forth. Usually um, in um, um, uh, most missionaries these days basically say, okay, don't marry anybody else um, and, uh, and just kind of freeze where you're at uh, in, your, uh, in your current state of polygamy. Um, and then of course your children uh, should uh, move toward monogamy um, going forward as Christian families. Female circumcision, um, 
Again, the, um, the United Nations uh, is opposed to female circumcision, which again shows that the United Nations is not entirely relativistic. Uh, because um, now, the, the thing about some of these practices like female circumcision, it, it, it is a uh, oppressive practice uh, toward women, although women are, are complicit in female circumcision um, within, in those contexts where it happens. And so um, uh, there can be societal injustices or, or, or structural uh, inequities that are perpetuated in societies. Um, Christianity would look for a, a long-term equity of all members of a, of a society. Female circumcision perpetuates a, a uh, inequity, uh, I would argue, uh, among the culture, even though women are strong supporters of it or have been in the past in, in various places. Um, it used to be the case, I don't think this happens uh, much anymore, but it used to be that a wife was expected to commit suicide to retain her honor if she was even accused of infidelity uh, to her husband in Japan. I don't think that is the case anymore. Uh, the ancient Greeks, it would seem, uh, considered it acceptable uh, for males to be sexually aroused by other males, perhaps even to the extent of pederasty, uh, where uh, uh, a, a older man and a younger boy would have some sort of a physical relationship. Um, uh, there's, I think, some debate about uh, these sorts of things, you know, play, but uh, there's Plato's Symposium uh, that has some overtones that maybe uh, along those lines, but um, certainly uh, Western culture today considers this sort of adult boy relationship to be uh, deeply wrong. Um, but it, it, there's at least some evidence uh, that it was not considered wrong in ancient Greece. Um, the Spartans and the Dobu, Dobu in Africa, Spartans in ancient Greece, um, thought that stealing was good training, kind of encouraged their uh, they're young to steal from the rest of from other people uh, because it's good practice. It helps, you know, it helps develop develop war skills, um, and so um, stealing was considered uh, to be good training. Now let's get to the Bible. You know the the law of Leveret marriage, where a younger brother must take on as an extra wife, uh, if he's already married, the wife of the older brother in order to have children if the older brother has dialed died uh, childless. So um, this is a practice which, of course, the New Testament does not retain. And uh, I don't know of any Christians today that consider this to be an appropriate practice, but it's an example of a, a rule in Deuteronomy that I don't know of any Christians that keep today. Um, and so, it, it, you know, um, again, it, some people would say, well, we, ha we have to do everything in the Bible. Well, there are many things that, that we don't, or there are things that we don't do in the Bible because whether consciously or subconsciously, we realize that it is locked up within the culture and the context. This is an example. Um, Greet the brothers with the holy kiss is, is another one um, that I don't see practiced much uh, in these days. Um, and so we recognize that, that a lot of those specific practices had much to do with the, the culture. They were relative to, they were, they were, they were based upon um, important principles, but that play themselves out in specific precepts in particular places, in particular ways in the Bible time that maybe don't apply um, to uh, different contexts and so forth. Uh, I, in my New Testament survey book, um, I mentioned that doing what they did isn't doing what they did if it doesn't have the same meaning. Uh, there are a lot of things that, that are traditions within even Judaism today that don't do what they did. Uh, so, for example, um, Jews today do not uh, have dairy and meat in the same plate or the same restaurant, uh, even. And so, this is because of the, the scripture that says, don't uh, boil a baby goat in the mother's milk. But I guarantee you that the way that that rule is practiced in Israel today has nothing to do with the original significance of that rule. And so, even though they may be kind of doing what they did, they're not doing what they did. They're not actually keeping that command by them or, um, or not being able to press an elevator button because it causes a spark that lights a fire and in numbers a guy gets um, put to death, stoned to death uh, for lighting a fire, gathering sticks to light a fire on the Sabbath. 
And so therefore, you're not supposed to press an elevator button in Israel um, uh, because you're lighting a fire. Well, pressing a button simply is not doing whatever the commandment was. And, and so th these are examples of relativisms within uh, the Bible, when, or, or to use a more acceptable word, contextualization, realizing the contextualization of the original biblical command. And we can, we can get a little controversial and talk about the Sabbath, because of course Paul says, one person considers one day more important than the others, another treats them all the same as the Lord's, that each do according, you know, according to their own conscience in so many words. Um, Paul says, don't let anybody judge you. He's talking to Gentiles in Colossians 2. Don't let anybody judge you by whether you keep a Sabbath. And so Paul treats the Sabbath legislation of the Old Testament as relative to Israel uh, and not applicable to Gentiles. It, he considers it a matter of individual conscience, of individual relativism. If you would, that's how Paul treats it. Um, what about early Christianity? Is it shameful for a woman to pray without wearing a veil, 1 Corinthians 11. Well, most Christian women do not um, consider this instruction to be timelessly universal. Um, there are people who wear prayer bonnets. There are others who interpret it by having a bun. Uh, but th this would be an example of where, whether we thought about it or not, we implicitly treat this instruction as relative to Corinthian and ancient Greek culture and not timeless or universal in its applicability, not that not that there can't not that there aren't principles uh, that we can abstract from this and consider to be timeless and universal. It's just that the concrete manifestation of it is not considered to be timeless or uh, or universal by just implicitly. If you go to a worship service, this was, I was in a worship service today. It's Sunday as I make this video in Houghton, New York, and I can tell you that I did not see a single bun or bonnet or veil in that worship service. And therefore, implicitly, every woman in that sanctuary was treating this instruction as first, in 1 Corinthians 11 as relative to the context in which Paul uh, first wrote it. So individual relativisms, again, I've talked about Nazarites who, who uh, don't drink wine, don't cut their hair. Um, this is uh, not something for all Israel, but it was something that specific individuals within Israel believed that God wanted them to do. We call these convictions. Well, moral nihilism. Again, I would, I would say that we are, we're not going to call ourselves nihilists as, as Christians. Uh, this is just not fundamentally at all uh, what Christians are. Um, but I can give you some examples of moral nihilists. Uh, the idea that, what, that power makes right and wrong, if I can get away with something, then it's right. Or certainly not wrong if I get away with it. This idea that might makes right, uh, that we might link to, for example, Machiavelli, uh, who wrote The Prince, um, although there is some debate about whether he really meant it. Um, but, but this idea that might makes right, or that power makes right, um, is certainly in the water of the world, and certainly in the water of history. Um, history is told by the winners, you know, that sort of, that, that idea that um, if, I, if I can do it, then who's to say it's wrong? That's a nihilistic sense of ethics. Uh, Dostoevsky believed in God, of course. Uh, but Dostoevsky said, if there is no God, then everything is permissible. Um, it, he, he paints a picture in which um, if there were no God, there would be no real uh, um, timeless or permanent or, or there would be no real objective basis on which to say that something was right or wrong uh, if you could get away with it. You could only argue that some things have certain benefits. Dostoevsky, of course, believed in God. Um, and, of course, there are moral philosophers who would disagree with Dostoevsky. Uh, however, I, I myself uh, tend to think that Dostoevsky is right, uh, that if there is no God, then it is difficult to come up with any kind of comprehensive uh, morality um, other than what is uh, advantageous um, to individuals and groups in general. Um, and, of course, uh, I've mentioned Nietzsche. Uh, Nietzsche basically believed that um, there are these Ubermensch, Ubermenschen, these supermen um, or women, who basically realize that there is no right and wrong fundamentally, 
uh, but they invent it and they convince others that that's right and wrong. And the Superman is the person who can invent a morality for others without being bound to morality, him or herself. And I think, um, again, I, I've not done a thorough study of this, but I feel quite convinced, uh, I, or, or let me say I have a, a very, very strong hunch that with the rise of Nazism in the 1930s and with the, um, the sense of Hitler uh, that he uh, was a, a, a Nietzschean Superman who could invent morality, that the, the rise of Superman comics, I, I suspect strongly, was a reaction to uh, what, what, Nietzsche, what uh, Hitler was doing with Nietzsche, what the Germans were doing with Nietzsche uh, in, in Ger Germany and Europe, um, with the superhero Superman being an example of somebody who is the right kind of Ubermensch. Well, this has been uh, a little bit of a, of a, a run through ethical duties from a Christian perspective. Also assuming the previous video, which suggests that a more virtue-based approach is more fundamentally Christian in terms of the New Testament and Jesus and Paul. However, ethical duties are part of virtue, right? Um, they're, they're not the primary, but they fit into it. And I've argued that the New Testament and Jesus and Paul and Christianity are primarily a universally oriented ethic when it comes to duties, that these are the fundamental Christian values, and that uh, there can be exceptions when the values come into uh, conflict with each other. But there are two absolutes. Uh, the, the mothers of all Christian absolutes are, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you must love your neighbors yourself. There are no exceptions to those two absolutes, and therefore Christianity is fundamentally absolutist in that sense. This has been a video on ethical duties and Christian deontology.